30 years of agriculture broadcasting, we've had the privilege of originating broadcasts from every state in America and 30 different nations. And the privilege of being out there on the farm, visiting with many of you who till the land, who produce our food for the world. That's been the best part. There are some memories that stand out to be sure, and one of those is the trip back to the farm all plant just before they started tearing it down. Thanks to the folks of the International Harvester Collectors Club, Chapter 10, we not only went back in that plant one last time, but we drove in that plant along the assembly line, the old tractors that had been made there some 50 years before. We talked with some of the people, too, who were a part of that plant, including a radio personality who once was on the security team for Farmall. Come along now to what was once a very busy, noisy plant where they were making at one time as many as 350 tractors a day. We drove those tractors down along what had been the assembly line of that massive plant that covered almost 50 acres, not far from the banks of the Mississippi River. At one time, as many as 5,000 people worked here. Popular Chicago radio personality Spike O'Dell remembers life at the Farmall plant in the 70s. In his life before radio, Spike worked here. That was a lot of property to cover from one side to the other. And, uh, uh, yeah, we had, uh, we had the little uh, golf carts we drove around in, the little uh, international cadet uh, utility tractors we drove around in, as well as uh, uh, outside car vehicles, the international scout. Everything was international and uh, walkie-talkies, and, uh, and uh, we, we walked that thing a million times. I can tell you every nook and cranny of that plant. You had a uniform and a badge. I looked like Barney Fife at age 21. <laughs> Bill Carius remembers the plant, too. In fact, he's had the job for many years of maintaining what was left of the old farm all plant. The company he works for is developing the site. It will be residential, not industrial. Nothing like the tractor building activity that once thrived here. As the tractor progressed off the end, um, it went through final inspection. Um, they also they had an indoor facility to uh, test tractors. They also had an outside facility. And then it was either shipped by rail or by flat uh, uh, trucking companies, flat cars. Uh. So there must have been a big holding yard here as well where the new tractors uh, were uh, positioned prior to loadout? Yes, the whole west end of this facility, which uh, still is owned by Navistar, um, was the holding area. And um, most tractors sat outside until it was time to ship, but they didn't stay here long. <laughs> now, if I follow you correctly, the parts for these tractors that went on these tractors, many of the parts were made right here as well. That's correct. Um, they had their own uh, uh, gray iron machining areas. They had their own foundry. Um, of course, they had a massive powerhouse that produced all power except for AC power, uh, steam, and DC power. Um, again, a city within a city. It's remarkable when you think about our just-in-time manufacturing procedures today. It's quite a contrast, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it certainly is. Um, it just amazes me what went on here years ago and, and the, uh, the individuals that worked here, that worked as a team, to try to produce a quality uh, tractor. And in, in fact, uh, today, uh, there's still many of them out there in the fields working, and uh, just, uh, goes to show uh, what a great job was done years ago. It was a little city here, actually, that made all of that happen, complete with its own police and fire protection. It was plant protection. <laughs> I still have my hat that I wore uh, sometimes on the weekends for... International Harvester Plant Protection, and I leave it up in my office to this day here. But, yeah, we were in charge of uh, uh, medical emergencies. Uh, we had some, some medical training. Uh, we were basically a volunteer fire department. We would blow the horn, and it was our job to get the truck to the location where the fire was, and then volunteer firemen would come answer the call, much like volunteer fire department in the country or, or, or a small town. And we were, all, we were all given training on how to put out a fire, depending on what type it was. So we did a little bit of both. So the plant had its own fire truck. Yeah, very nice fire truck, yeah. Very nice fire truck. An international we trust. International harvester fire truck. <laughs> and uh, if it were something bigger, 
If it were a major event, then you would call in the city of, of Rock Island. Oh, sure. And they were just right down the street. So it was just, it was our job to get it going, as well as the medical stuff, too. We were just, you know, a mile away from uh, from the hospitals. And uh, if, if something was that urgent, we just, you know, we were at the hospital in five minutes or less. Veteran International Harvester employee Bill Borgoff remembers life here. He worked here for a while. And on the day we returned with the old tractors, he brought back his tractor made here, a unique tractor that was assembled in this farm all plant. Well, that tractor is the uh, first farm all 806 diesel that was manufactured. It was, uh, it has serial number 502. It was built in the summer just prior to shutdown in 1963. And it was one of 10 or 12 pilot production tractors, which were then sent into the engineering center at Hinsdale. And, uh, and then from there, the, the engineers went over and made sure the plant put things together properly. Then they were sent out for various introductory shows. So in 1963, I was a young test engineer at Hinsdale, and I tested that tractor at that time. Bill recalls that life in Farmall was often family life. Generations of families toiled here. There were numerous employees here who, who had other relatives that worked here. I had uh, an, an inspection supervisor working with me that, that started here when he was 16 years old. And he, he left the plant. Uh, he retired. I don't know. He was almost 70 years old. So he was in this plant for well over 50 years. And, um, you know, you think about people like that when you see this. He knew this place inside and out and what happened when. And uh, it just, you know, those are the kind of memories that, that stick with you. As we walked through what was left of the Farmall plant, some of that visit was rather eerie, especially the visit to the locker rooms where it almost seemed some of the workers had walked out expecting to be back the next day, the day that never came, over 20 years ago. But it was the assembly line that most people remember. Our friend Spike hasn't forgotten it. It was fascinating to me that you would start with this part at the very beginning of Department 37, and then someone would attach something else to it, and someone would attach something else to it, and what starts this big ends up an entire tractor. And one of my routes that I would walk for fire purposes, we'd have to walk a certain route to make sure everything was all right. I would walk down that entire line in its entirety, and it, and, and it amazed me every time I did that, that it starts with this piece and ends up this huge, beautiful tractor. Was there much interaction with you from, from workers on the line? they just look over and say, oh, there's a security kid. Well, <laughs> you know, it starts out that way. They kind of look at you because they don't know who you are, and they, they kind of hold you at arm's length. But... I got to be very good friends with a whole lot of people there. Still some of my best memories in the world come uh, from inside the, uh, the farm all plant. And I still keep in touch with a lot of people that I worked with, and they're still some of my very best friends today. You probably couldn't see it as we drove those tractors, but the exhaust was blowing up and flecks of paint came snowing down from the steel beams. But those pigeons perched up there that have been there so long hardly budged a bit. Not long after we were in the farm all plant, a longtime writer for the Quad Cities Times newspaper, Bill Wundrum, went back for his last visit. He described it as like walking through a haunted cemetery with a heavy odor of oil and creosote. Yeah, I suppose there was a little bit of sadness as we drove through there. But more than that, an appreciation for the thousands of tradesmen and women who toiled there, making such a magnificent product that we still respect after all these years.